Let's get this going. So, uh, so uh, let me read this paper here. So, anyway, welcome everyone to the 161st monthly uh, meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. Tonight we are going to be hearing from Anna Iselman, who will be. I got that right, right? Iselman or Iselman? Iselman. Okay. Uh, who will be providing us an overview of the Python uh, scientific computing stack with a focus on working with very large data sets. Um, tonight, before we get started, we have three quick requests and a couple of uh, actually other announcements from uh, our little host. Uh, first, if we could take this time to silence your phones, put it on mute, turn it off, whatever is most appropriate for you, um, that would be appreciated. Uh, second, if you could avoid using the coffee machines or anything back there that's going to generate noise during the presentation, because that will interfere with everyone else's ability to appreciate it. Uh, they really can be disruptive. Um, finally, if you have any questions, uh, raise your hand and someone with uh, this mic that I'm using will come over and uh, that way everyone can hear you when you get it recorded. Um, a couple of quick, uh, quick items uh, from our Google host. One is if you want access to the internet while you're here, we don't want to use your mobile data plan. Uh, or if you want to use a computer, there's the Google Guest Network that should be available to everybody. And also if you need to go to the bathroom, the restrooms are out there to the left. Okay. Um, so, the next part of this. We would um, like to take this time to thank our Google sponsors for the space. Um, we really do appreciate this. Without them, these meetings wouldn't be possible. And we'd also like to thank our other sponsors, IBM, Canonical, the Brandor Group, and O'Reilly Media. Uh, and we also want to thank everyone from Nylog who helps make this possible. Um, if you would like to reach out to the leadership team at Nylog, uh, feel free to grab me or anyone else who uh, you might know. But by all means, just grab me. I'll be uh, probably in the back once the presentation gets started. Um, my name, by the way, is Peter. Uh, a couple of other people. Brian is right over there. Um, Danny over there is up on the camera. And anyway, we're all uh, we're all around here. Um, all right. So if you want to. Uh, Sorry, got off track here. All right, feel free to visit our website. It's at www.nylog.org. That's N-Y-L-U-G dot O-R-G for more information about Nylog, uh, for uh, information about how to join our mailing list or to jump on our IRC channel. Uh, tonight, after Hannah gives her talk, she'll be asking you guys three trivia questions, and if you're paying attention, you should be able to answer them. Whatever you do, do not just shout out your answer. The first person to raise their hand, called on and get the right answer as the person who wins. That'll, that'll make everyone a lot happier at the end of the night. Um, the, uh, the prize for each one of the correct uh, answers is going to be an O'Reilly ebook coupon. So, uh, you know, like, that's, you know, everyone can get behind that. Um, after the meeting, we're going to have Stomtish uh, at McKenna's Pub, that is, everyone goes for drinks, at 250 West 14th Street. If, uh, if you don't remember that, just you know, ask again any of us afterwards. Between 7th and 8th Avenue. Thank you. Between 7th and 8th. Again, that's 250 West 14th Street between 7th and 8th on the uh, north side of the street. South side. Oh, we moved it. I'm so sorry. I've been here a little while. <laughs> yeah. My bad. Oh, gosh. I'm sitting in the wrong place. Um, what we'll do is we'll, each of us will be leading groups going out there. So on the way out, just look for one of the groups forming and head out. And at the end, someone will make sure that anyone uh, left will be able to get there as well. Um, a few quick announcements. So next month, O'Reilly Media is hosting a big data conference called Strata and Hadoop World. They graciously offered us a 20% discount on tickets, it, so to claim that, see our meetup perks page, okay? Um, our next workshop is September 25th. Please see Rob, David, or Hannah after the meeting if you'd like to find out more about the, uh, the workshops. You can always check out the meetup page for that also. Um, I also want to mention, I think, uh, at this point, that there's an event tomorrow called Data Gotham. You can look at datagotham.com. Uh, we don't have much information about this, but a friend of the group asked that we mention it. And uh, if that would interest you, you know, go check it out. Mm -hmm. Next. Ah, great. Our next two monthly presentations are going to cover Gannetti, a clustered visualization management framework, and Ubuntu, Google's own Linux distro that's based on Ubuntu. And finally, Forest Mars is organizing this year's New York Software Freedom Day festivities. Sorry about that, I got so excited. Um, that's going to be uh, the 15th, Saturday the 15th. So, Forest? Great. Uh, you want to come up and. Uh, 
Okay, seriously, how many people before Peter mentioned that actually knew about it? That's a lot of people who do not read the Nylog list. There is no more Nylog list. What's that? There is no more Nylog list. Oh, so you sorry to announce we're not going on the list? I'm not sure if that was serious. <laughs> um, so a lot of people didn't raise their hands. So on uh, the day after tomorrow, this Saturday, we're going to have the uh, fifth annual Software Freedom Day in New York City. Uh, something that Frederick Miller started in 2004. We've been doing it in New York since 2008, and we're going to do it at uh, ITP, uh, which who doesn't know where the uh, American Telecommunications Program is at NYU? So we have like all of three or four people that don't know where that's at. That's pretty amazing. So, Broadway. So, <laughs> where is it? The address. 721 Broadway. So it's just, 721 off, Broadway. It's just off Astor Place. It's going to start okay. at 6.30 and run until 10 o'clock. And as in previous years, uh, we are well, we, we have a couple sponsors. So Fedora is sponsoring and some other sponsors have said they're going to sponsor. So we should have beer and food and just uh, general uh, celebration of free software. And then at 8 o'clock, we're going to have a number of presentations and talks. Uh, James Vasily of um, the Software Freedom Law Center is going to be talking on uh, software freedom in the age of censorship and surveillance. Um, we're going to have um, uh, John Stanley from the Fedora Project is going to be giving a talk, and a whole bunch of other people. We're also going to have uh, um, uh, two huge breakout rooms so you can bring laptops and share and hack in projects. And it's just a big celebration of uh, software freedom. Um, who's, who knows for a fact they're not going? This mic sucks, by the way. One, one, two, three. Excellent. See everyone else there. <laughs> right. you're, you're all. But RSVP. No, but there is no need to RSVP. There's no need to RSVP. Uh, you can go to sfd2012.eventbrite.com. Um, or you can just go to cfsg.org. Or csfg.org. CFSG, Community Free Software. Thank you. cfsg.org. Okay. Um, anyone else have any other announcements from the audience? Anyone want to uh, come up for announcements? Brian? And I, just want to, I just want to let people know I'm starting to uh, get ideas and look for speakers for next year. So if you are interested, you can send uh, hit me up on Meetup or you can hit info at nylog.org. Great. Anybody else? Over. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the month, the people who lend us with stuff in the O'Reilly will be throwing the Maker Fair, New York Hall of Science. If you don't already have tickets, you can find them either via Radio Shack, if you remember, and Whole Foods. That's 29. So for anyone who doesn't know about this or wasn't aware that it was coming up, Maker Fair is uh, attached to a big magazine in O'Reilly Media. It should be a lot of fun for adults, kids, families. Uh, I know that I'm actually excited to try to plan and go for the first time. So um, I think that's it for announcements, uh, unless anyone else has anything. Okay, uh, Hannah, do you want to take this over? Some of these have gone to like 50 years at four hours, so 
this works out to a lot of timestamps. Um, and generally, the lo it's always global or model data or the, um, observational data but always geospatial. So, and we'll talk about more of that, that more in detail tonight. Yeah. Um, so this year I did, I was working at um, NCOG for the summer, and NCOG is a National Consortium of Atmosphere Research. They're one of those, they're non, they're semi-governmental private university services doing research in the climate sciences. So their specialty is kind of, um, <coughs> um, and the other that, and that was working on taking this, one of their analysis was for their large data sets and writing a web interface so that you could play with it outside of their um, machines because the problem with a lot of these large data sets is to work with them, you have to have access to the service they're on because we're talking terabytes here. Like I tried to download on, my Mac, on the Mac they gave me and it crashed. Um, and the, the year before that, I did a Google Summer of Code project which was also making this web-based view of a common climate data set type, file format. And the reason for that is that the climate file formats are what's called hierarchical data formats, which means that, um, you know, they're going to have a ton of information in them, um, or they're going to be self-documenting, so within the file, it's going to tell you about the file. Um, they have time series data and spatial data, and it's a giant matrix. And so trying to visualize this on the web, like you could use Google Charts, and Google Charts is awesome, but th you're sending megabytes or gigabytes client side to generate. This doesn't really work, right? On the other hand, you don't want to sometimes make people have to download their data, the data on their machines if they just want one snapshot. Um, okay. So we're talking big data, right? So what are the three attributes of big data? One, well, big data is by definition huge. We, since we're dealing with climate data, we're dealing with earth, earth full of data. What that means is, if you can think about it, we have it, we have, you know, if we're gonna look at the earth on these grids, we're gonna look at the earth and, um, with the core resolution, so 2.5 resolution or 1.5 resolution. And this means that, take the earth, chop it up into 50 kilometer squares, and take data for every 50 kilometers. And do that every four hours. You very quickly end up with a lot more data than your average machine can fit, right? And this is typical. You know, most of these geostationary, sa geostationary satellites are doing every four hours or every eight hours, and so, and they're doing 50 to 100 kilometer slots. So this is the kind of data we're an you're analyzing all the time, daily basis, because you're trying to pull out your patterns. The other thing about big data is velocity. So the thing with velocity is this is the speed at which we get data. Again, because with satellites, we're doing a swath around the Earth, and we keep doing more swaths and more swaths. So as soon as that recording, the recording comes in. And as soon as we finish that swath, well, actually, while we're doing the swath, the recording comes in. And the reason for this is the satellites, they don't have that much memory on them. So what they want to do is they want to just take the reading and pop it down to us. Yeah. CCMI actually has a little receiving station on the roof um, for this kind of stuff. And here's the thing, you know, you want to work with this data as fast as possible. That's where the velocity comes in. Because like, if I'm trying to forecast the weather tomorrow based on today's weather, I can't really wait for that month to take four days, right? You know? So, <laughs> how... You know, and at the same thing kind of like if I'm doing trend data, like if I have this hot new pro product I want to put out to market, and I'm, I'm going to try, and, I, and it's going to be something like teenagers, teenagers ads, they're going to change their minds fast. I can't look at last year's data. I need, you know, minute by minute. So I want to be able, so I need to be able to work with data as it comes. That's your other big data challenge here. And the other thing with big data is variety. We have a lot of different types, right? You know, there's intra file variety where I'm having different, I'm having data at different times and I'm having the data at different locations. And there's also the fact that I don't want to just look at like the temperature of the earth, right? I want to look at how temperature and wind and water and earth all interact with each other. Like if I'm building a weather model or a climate model, or if I'm dealing with marketing data, I want to face with demographic data, you know? 
I'm dealing with data where it's not all one type, so I have to be able to, you know, meld this all into something that can work, right? So what's the problem we're trying to do with data? Well, first, time, right? You know, big data, because you know it's most operations of end time, even if you're dealing with login time. So even if you're dealing with faster algorithms, if your data's kind of big, you could spend days or weeks waiting for some of these operations to finish. And so that's fine if you're building, you know, the new shiny climate model of long-term variation. Not too helpful if you're trying to, again, predict a monsoon that's supposed to hit India tomorrow. Um, so a big problem here is time. The other big problem, and raise your hand if you've seen this, is memory. How many of you have seen the therapist? <laughs> you know. Yeah. So for those of you that don't know, when you're trying to do large operations in Python, um, like you didn't pay attention to what you were sending into SciPy, you'll blow it up really fast. And this is assuming you haven't just crashed your machine to a halt waiting for the operation to occur. Um, so how do we do all this, right? How do we do stuff fast? How do we do stuff without going up? So our standard toolkit is SciPy and NumPy. For those of you who don't know, SciPy and NumPy are the standard Python libraries for doing scientific computing. Um, NumPy is our bare bones math library. Like that's the thing we're going to write, be writing the formulas in. That's the thing, like if I'm writing a big old linear algebra algorithm, I do that using the NumPy library. You know, it's the bare metal that deals with the matrices um, and all that. Um, SciPy is one level above that. SciPy makes use of NumPy. So the idea with SciPy is it's got a lot of that bare metal math you would write with NumPy already if it's math. You know, it's got it in its out, um, and it's segmented out into its different libraries. We'll talk about later that. So you don't have to waste your time figuring out how to write a fast for your transfer in Python. And also the thing with SciPy and NumPy is they don't even write it in Python. They've already done the optimizations of writing it in Fortran or in C, um, C++, and pitching up to there so that they can do a lot of the fast optimizations without going to worry about it. Now this is incredible speed up because how many of you have had to try by hand to optimize code? <laughs> Yeah, so I already hear the drums. So yes, the reason to use them is used by everybody. Already, a lot of stuff is already pre-done. Now, granted, they're also always looking for developers to like add more. Okay. Um, now, so we've got sci-fi. We've got fi we've got sci-fi, right? So let's figure out how do we actually work with it with our file. Okay, I'm going to pick an arbitrary file that we'll talk about later. Um, and here's how we open a file. In the, um, for those of you who haven't seen Python before, what we're doing first is importing our SciPy library. We'll assume we've already installed it, right? <coughs> if you don't have it, install it. Use pip, which is the Python package manager, because it'll make life a lot easier. Um, but, so it is true. We're going to pull it down. Then we're going to open the file. But Python, again, we've been saying before, it's small, right? This operation, data set, opening the file, that doesn't load anything to memory. We're not touching. We're not touching our file. We're just creating a pointer to the file. Anybody, everybody hear those pointers? Okay. Um, for those who don't, um, pointers essentially just tells us the address of that file on disk. So it's just going to do that. Not going to touch anything. So that's going to be the file. These files, because we're dealing with um, load, these kind of hierarchical data sets, the file is really a collection of tables, and these tables are attributes of the file. So one table is going to be time, and that's going to tell me the time that, that what the timestamp for every index in one dimension. And one record is going to be latitude. Same thing, the latitude at every at every index for that dimension, and longitude. And another one or two are going to be whichever variables with the actual raw data is in there. We know which one that is because that's the one that the, has the dimensionality we're looking for. Sometimes we can have two like this for different altitudes and things like that. But so if we don't know what file we're looking for, this is just a <coughs> plain old Python dictionary. So we can throw a print statement around that, get out our keys, and then we get our key. And so what we're doing here with this var 
is we're going to pull out um, a value. But again, we're not touching real data. We're just bringing a point through. And keep this in mind because this is where a lot of that efficiency comes in. That, whenever, that with Python, you don't have to you don't have to take more data than you need, um, because that's what, that's what will often kill you. Um, we'll talk about this in a bit. But okay, so we're going to pull out our data, and here is slicing. What we mean by slicing is that's how we actually extract the data, and we'll talk about this next. So what is the slicing thing? You guys were seeing the weird back in notation. Um, so in Python, and this was simply for list comprehensions, and I see the people who know Python are just laughing because they know it's sleep. But for those of you who know, um, so we're doing a start, a stop, a step, which means, and this tells us, you know, start at that row, go to the set, the second row, um, and end, and take every whatever of that. Okay? The reason I'm having this is we can do this either way. We can either do it by dimension and separate with comma, or we can break it out. And you're going to want to choose notation based on what you need. Like what's going to make the equivalent, they both work. And it's going to, and it's going to be based on kind of, you know, if you're going to do something fancier in here, and I'll give you examples later, you might want to break it out like that. And so the thing, the, this, the reason this is really important for big data is that the only time we've actually started pulling stuff into memory is after we've executed all of that. Step one, two, three, reducing down. But just think about it. The first time we do this, we reduce our dimensionality down to 10 rows. We're taking every second row from, in 20 rows, 10. And here we've reduced our ten dimensionality down to 10 rows, I think four columns, five columns. Yeah, every fourth row, ten rows, five columns, and then here we're reducing our dimensionally down even smaller to every third element. So our data set, which in this case was originally um, 312 by 144 by 73, is now 10 by 10. It's like 10 by 5 by. Oh, I can do the math on this. I think 10 by 5 by about 20, 15. So, um, and the reason I'm saying this is because for not a lot of the big data texts, you guys, you don't really need all the data, right? Or you don't really need all the data all at once. You can work with piecemeal or, you can work with piecemeal or you can um, spend, sorry, um, you can work with piecemeal or you can um, send it in as needed. Um, Basically, think about it this way. For working with climate data, maybe you only need every month. Or maybe you only need weather for Africa. Okay. So, we have this. So, what, okay, SciPy's are typically tokenists, right? The other ones we're going to look at are NetCDF, which, the reason for this is that for the like one data type that SciPy won't handle, this will handle, which is NetCDF 4, which is the new standard in the climate community. And the other thing, reason I want to bring this up is to point out that it works exactly the same way. They all do. Um, we open our data set with a, using a pointer, we point to this, and we don't actually extract anything until we start slicing. Um, the other tool for this is pie tables, and um, the reason to use pie tables is it's supposed to be really good for larger data sets. Um, it was private, they've open sourced their advantages now, and it's supposed to be for like files, I think 8 gigs or higher, they have much faster I.O. And again, the syntax is exactly the same. We're still just having pointed to the file, pointed to the data, don't load anything until we need it. Okay, so this is all great if I have the data locally, right? But what if the data is too big for local? Well, hi DAP. So DAP, which is Data Access Protocol, is kind of a standard in the scientific communities for serving your data over the internet. The idea is, on your machines or whoever machines, they have a thread server. Okay, you, most people are using right now threads, it's a Java-based server to serve data, but you can also have, um, um, there's a PyDAP, there's actual Python server, and I think there might be something written in C. And so it'll serve the data out. So again, you open a connection to the file, you get out the piece you need, and then you only download the piece you need. And this is what we do when we're dealing with terabyte. Because here's the other thing, you don't have to, 
you can do this where it's on a foreign machine. This is also a way to do distributed machine data management. Because nothing says you can't run your own thread server. Um, and there are reasons for doing this if you don't want to deal with if depending on how you're setting up your mounting scheme or your management scheme, where you don't want to have to use SciPy directly. Um, or also the other reason to use this um, is if you don't if you don't want to expose which machine it's on, so you can, you can keep rotating your machines and just keep the address the same. So that's the other big advantage to hide that. Okay, so that's NetCF, but I know a lot of you aren't working with NetCF, and I'm never going to touch it. So what do we do then? Well, Python does all the standard ones. It'll still do a text, a data, a CSV, you know, HTML. HTML is great, actually, because there's um, two ways we like doing this. One, you, you can use URL lib and request to just pull it down straight. Um, and then you can use beautiful soup to just pass out the piece you need. Um, beautiful soup is a big friendly one for this. The other option is um, the, if you're doing with HTML data, um, Scrapey is the big Python web scrape. And right? again, you can have it kind you can have it pre-filtered to get out just the pieces you need. So you're downloading stuff temporarily, but you're not stuck having all this data you don't need on your machine. Um, if you're dealing with NumPy, NumPy, if, and I, it's not one of the ones I talked about before, um, Mem has M Mem app, and the NumPy M Mem map works the exact same way as all of the SciPy and SDF stuff. You can set up a pointer to your file, and then you can only extract the piece you need. So again, you're avoiding loading all your, your entire file into memory, um, and you're only taking the piece you need um, as you need it. Okay. And when the quantum sciences community pingles the big one, that's by NCAR, and it wraps kind of the same underlying layer as the NCL, which is an NCAR command language library. Um, oh, I just also need PyNIO. So the deal with using pingle and PyNIO is good visualizations for this kind of data, and they can handle every other data type you've never seen that you need. Um, they're really good for like shape files and grid files, and for those who don't know, the shape files are the census files. So if you're doing demographics data, they're kind of people to go with. The other one for this is GDAL. Um, GDAL is the geospatial data abstraction library. Again, it'll just pull your file. It handles kind of anything you haven't seen in any of the other ones. Um, and I think GDAL is supported by like the group that does the standards for GIST data. Um, and then if you're working with databases, well, SQL Alchemy is one of my favorite tools. Um, it's an object relational mapper. It doesn't care about the underlying database in the least. You can use it with SQLite, you can use it with MySQL, you can use it with Postgres. As long as it's an SQL database of sorts, you can talk to it using SQLite. And using SQL Alchemy, sorry. And what this means is that you can write your test code um, using, you can write your test stuff on SQL, on a tiny little SQLite database, and then you can run it um, using your huge database without losing, without having to have that overhead in the first place. And without having to change everything. Um, Mongo Alchemy is the equivalent for Mongo if your data, if that Mongo makes more sense for your data. Okay. So we have the we have our file and we have it loaded to memory, right? What do we want to do with it? So the big thing we want to do with it at first is um, Calculate our basic stats, right? And we can do this regardless of whatever we're dealing with. We can take our mean, we can take our mean across any dimension. It's a standard argument. Um, we just passed the law. Um, you know, and of course, depending on which dimension we decide to take the mean at, we can get our shapes change. There's nothing different magical um, about this. And it's the mean standard, kind of all the basic ones are built in. Um, anything slightly more advanced than this, you go to SciPy and it has it. Um, but okay, so what I'm going to do, this will work until you hit memory error on this. And you can hit memory errors on this too, right? Okay, or take more effort. So if you're hitting a memory error on this, well, use a streaming app. Okay, use a streaming algorithm. And they have been behind streaming algorithms, and these are kind of recommended in big data is you take your, this is the whole, you don't take your data at once, you chop it up. You know, mean is the standard for this, that we're gonna take our mean, we're gonna take one mean at one time step at a time, we're gonna load it so that in memory, we only have one row at a time of our database, 
Well, actually, we have only have one column, one depth at a time. So we've thrown out a dimension. Um, and then we're going to just get that result and then move on to the next one. And the reason to do that is a generator. This is a generator syntax. Is generators don't make copies of lists. They just keep one copy of a list. You're going to do it, and then it's going to stack this into um, a into your song. So you've reduced that over. <coughs> so yes. So in general, just as a, as a rule for big data, try to avoid list comprehensions. You almost anything you can do in list comprehension, you can do as a generator. The only difference is generators are used once. So that's what you have to be careful. Um, okay. So what else can we do with this, right? So like I was saying before, we can do our linear algebra using nothing, right? Whatever linear algebra we can do, we can do. And so if we're finding that stuff is too slow, and the way to test if stuff is too slow is to use a pro profiler. The best Python profiler that I've seen is KernProf, and that's because it does line by line human readable. How many of you have used it before? What's the name? Kernprof, K-E-R-N-P-R-O-F. Okay. Yeah, Kernprof is the only, it's kind of, K-E-R-N, yeah. K-E-R-N-P-R-O-F is kind of, it's the stand, or it's my favorite of the profilers because it, it, it picks out the line you're using and it'll highlight it. So, and so this prevents you from having to do hunt and pack because the standard Python library for profilers, if you've seen, kind of dig you very deep into system internals. Um, and so once we find that thing that broke, um, we find that, like in a lot of cases, we don't want to be doing comprehension, right? Comprehension, this comprehension's bad. This is an array comprehension, whoops. Like the sci-fi developers will tell you, do not do this. And that's because this makes copies of everything and it just breaks. And so what you want to be doing instead is vectorization. And vectorization is just um, doing a matrix, doing matrix operations across the board instead of like so parsing things out. So vectorization is kind of hard if you don't have a background in um, linear algebra. And at that point, I would suggest that you, you know, if you don't have to find somebody who does and ask them to do it. But when I was doing this with one data set, I saw four to ten times speed of um, which can be, you know, difference between 20 minutes and two days. So, always write those. And by the way, Python, NumPy do, do this. The reason to use NumPy and SciPy is that they do this internally. So they handle a lot of self-organization under the hood. Which is also why they're writing stuff in Fortran, because Fortran does this automatically too, with for loops. Okay. So, right, we can do line algebra using NumPy. And so we're going to then go on to more advanced things, right? Because maybe we want more than just mean and the distance. And distances are in already written in sci so you don't even have to bother with it. And it's just as fast because it's being read by. So, yeah. excuse me, I'm sorry. So uh, I think you went into a lot of detail there, and I was curious if you could tell us sort of what, in cases like this, sort of what the beginning and end results are that you're looking for and how this helped you, because I feel like I got a little bit yeah. lost uh, somewhere. Yeah. I'm sorry, so, I just Yeah, no, I, I know. I'm bad about it. Um, so the, here I was looking for the distance between my points in space and the core matrix because I was trying to do clustering. I was trying to figure out, like, how far is each observation from this cluster sensor so that I can do classification. Um, and so here I was working on this one, I was working on that day, so it was like 10,000 observations. No, 80,000 observations, sorry. And so in a data set where there's like 80,000 observations, and you're trying to find the difference between each individual <coughs> observation, and each observation has 10,000 points in it. Basically, because you're not storing the whole entire file, you're trying to parse through. Well, we bring up the average Can you hear you? Yeah, so the big thing is with distance. Can you repeat the question? <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Hannah, could you repeat it since you're Oh, sorry. So, what, the, the well, question basically, is? because he's not, she's not storing the entire file. She's not storing the entire file. She needs to get those points and then put them into her, her, her set that yeah. she's creating. Well, 
this one is just because your standard distance metric, the idea is you, you do it one feature at a time. Like, I do, yeah, like, uh, yeah, just, and a lot of them are designed this way, where you're de deleting one feature at a time. Um, um, yeah, just knocking it through. So, but if you try to do that, it ends up being really slow, obviously, when you're dealing with like 80,000 at a time. And so that's the point at which you want to start looking at these kind of things, because now you're not, it's no longer a lot, it's no longer an end time complexity problem. Yeah. Or even if it is, it's under the hood and optimized. But yeah, usually that's fine. You said you wanted an error number. Well, what you're trying to avoid is taking days. So, the other thing we're going to want to do with this is use it for more advanced than algebra, right? Uh, and so, that's the concept that's it's built in under the hood side, right? Um, We've got language processing, we've got uh, FD, FFT pack, um, which is Fourier transforms and the image. So if I have, was this useful as um, remote sensing data, time series, anything where I need to start analyzing signals and making sense of them, um, cleaning them up. The other thing is it's going to have all that probability, the stats and the algebra, the clustering, basic clustering. So again, I can just start reducing my data dimensionality down. Because here's the thing, even if I can actually load all my data into memory, once it gets so big, I'm not going to be able to make sense of it, right? Like, think about, so, you know, I give you 80,000 points. Can you give me an, anal an, an analysis on that? You know, by explanation? Okay, so, one of the examples of this while I was dealing with was smoothing out time series. Because I was dealing with monthly data. No, this is the four hour time data. And so, and there's a lot of seasonal variation. And I was looking for long term climate patterns. Long term climate patterns are going to be lost under seasonal or daily variations. So you want to filter that out. And so the idea is instead of having to write all this crazy code for convolution, I can just use the convol function and call it a day. Um, and the advantage of this, of course, is saving developer time. Because A, it means that you don't need to pull in a math major in AE to write this, the convolution. You don't have to be sitting there debugging to see if you did it right. You know, you can just, it's tested, it's documented, pull out of the box and do it. Um, this was a Gaussian and the code function is just a great Gaussian. Um, which is, it's smoothing out using the normal code. That's what I'm doing. So I'm trying to take the average of the normal temperatures and subtracting that out. The average of the, the average of the temperatures over a period of time and subtracting that out from my signal so that I thrown out the noise. Okay. Okay. So the comments is Gauss is an array of? Yeah, I lost that. Gauss is an array, it's a ga it's a normal curve basically. So it's an array of values that fit along a normal curve for this data normal distribution for this data set. Like, yeah, so look, that's, <laughs> yeah, no, so yeah, that, we're using that to, so that we can just take all of the data under that um, and weigh it so that, you know, signals closer to the point I'm looking at are going to be more important than stuff further away. And so, therefore, I can just take the average of that with the weights and then subtract that out so I can clean it. I can clean it up, but I want to get more ways to things closer because the assumption is that time periods closer to my data uh, have more weight on the current time period. It's a standard technique. That's why it's used also for temporal and spatial smoothing for that reason. Like it's a standard technique. Is that going back towards the points you said earlier? Probably. <laughs> Uh, Sci-fi sounds fairly similar to MATLAB, Orbital, and yeah. also to Scilab. Could you compare and contrast the codes as to why would you use one rather than the other? Is it free? <laughs> well, I hope you have so, so, uh, so it, here's the thing. I think, I don't know. I know Octave, when I've played around with it, it just, the reason to use Sci-fi over Octave or Scilab is that SciPy, you also have Python, so you have a full-body language. 
And the idea is that you could, so therefore you could like octave, you have some visualization, but not many, and I don't know if I love. So the idea is you, you can do full stack integration in Python, but you can do a lot of stack integration in Python. And you're, so you're not stuck like, I'm going to do my data here, and then I'm going to move to this other language to do this, and I'm going to do another language to do that. And there's a real advantage that when you start talking about, like, with these large data, it's like, wait, I need to start adding in networking code, or I need to start adding in, you know, server-side response code, or, you know, I want to use Slack, but hey, my data is also, uh, um, semantic web stuff, and I want to now pull in a semantic web library to clean it, to look at it. And if I was using something like Octave, I don't know if there's a library built in. Um, I can also mention that one of the other advantages is that um, sci-fi scales, well, Python generally and sci-fi along with it scales out well uh, for anything that you might want to distribute to a cluster or to a cloud platform. So if you want to write something that gathers data and transforms it, that has a map reduce function that uh, can be operated on, then you can write the code, test it, and then deploy it without having to buy a thousand licenses for a one hour run. Yeah, this True. is where, it's actually the slide, like, so I've written this code, and how am I going to make it go faster? And I'll bring it up to this point. Kudu has Python bindings or Python libraries, so you can just do that straightly. Another library gaining lots of popularity I've seen by the community is Desco, which is another of these task schedulers. From what I've seen, it's kind of like an open API for Python. It's going to do task schedule, it's going to distribute it you know, across clusters. So you can, again, like you said, just marry that in. Yeah. Thanks. Have, isn't there also some work going on with that within IPython itself to distribute yeah, this, jobs? Yeah, this Power Power IPython now that they're working with, and they're looking at like doing down the line compilers, and yeah. So there's, like, I think, like, whenever I've been hearing talks about SciPy, that's kind of the direction that we're moving into, these parallel shared memory management type schemes. And that's like the first point, because Python has its own multiprocessing library that you can just use out of the box. You sometimes have to write your own views for it, uh, because, like, yes, I see people say, nodding their heads here, because the Python Q can be rather than the wrong. Is it simplistic or just bad? <laughs> um, so the problem with it is like it's just not sharing the your resources properly across all your workers. And so so you can use it out of box with caveats. The other problem is you have to be really, really careful. Like the reason I'm making this up is my previous code, that signal processing, it's this is what's called, you know, embarrassingly paralyzable. Like they're all independent, which means they can all go off and do their own thing and I can just collect my my smoothest smooth signals afterwards. But with Python, you have to be really careful that um, when you're dealing with multiprocessing libraries that you've set, separated your memory out correctly. Otherwise, it's going to try to share your entire data set across all of them. And now you've not only lost all the benefit of parallelization, you've closed your machine because you're trying to replicate this huge file multiple times. Would you like to Do you have a question? No, I was just going to say that. Uh, by default, um, either Nuffy or SciPy actually sharing memory. It's uh, everyone's by copy. Uh, it's by value. So it's mm -hmm. so I mean, if you do multiprocessing on our data set, just the idea of actually copying values between machines will actually destroy yes. oh, yeah. sometimes. Okay. I've, I've, yeah. It's just happened to me so many times. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing you have to be. That's why I was talking so much about this whole be careful about doing a. Um, like, that's why I'm stressing so much this point of stuff in slicing, because so many times, and like he points out, like even if that thing is 8 gigs, and my, mem my machine has 32 <coughs> gigs of memory, that, um, the linear algebra thing I wanted to run it through has a space complexity of n cubed, or something. So you will often see that, like, this thing that you're thinking, oh, it's only going to work, yeah, not so much. Um, and that kind of goes back into um, yeah, uh, it's called chunking. Is this whole chopping the memory code? Um, so the other thing is, if you're desperate, like if you know, most passing won't help you, and that just won't help you, and nothing else like is not helping. You can always write it in assembly or C. Python has, but here's the upside: of this. you don't have to go outside of Python to do it. So there's none of this like, oh, we need to call subprocess and push it off to that to get it back and yeah. 
you know, Python has inside the standard library something called C types, which lets you just write native C and bind to, or bind to native C calling to Python. And there's also Weave, which is other these like bare level um, optimization libraries. I think it's also like C or assembly, and you're just writing it and it'll execute. I don't recommend going that route, but. Um, yeah, Pi, um, no, as to Pi. He was asking if there's anything available for Fortran. Okay. Quick question, I'm sorry. <coughs> if you do go that route, do you lose your pointers? I mean, are you having to come back and re-compile? Or re, re like, like, it's not going to be one to one enough. Right. I think so. Right. 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 When you go out of function, that dictionary will be changed. And so, when this is why, if you need a true copy, you need to be doing dot copy. Okay, that's a uh, Python side. Okay, so what are we working with here? Right. Um, I, I was in my case study is this GPCP climate piece of data. Um, this one's relatively tiny in the land of big data um, <laughs> because it's monthly, but it's still you know, global at high resolution. And so, like I was saying, I can use my number, I can use my sci-fi, right? But that's just gonna get a lot of plots, right? And a whole lot of plots that I just, like having to look at a thousand plots to figure out something, not so useful, right? Like I haven't really gained all that much time. And this is where I want to be, go into machine learning. You know, and this is, I think, where Python really shines, is it makes machine learning simple. You don't need to, yeah. For those of us that aren't familiar with climate data, what are you trying to extrapolate from this particular data? <laughs> Repeat. <laughs> what are you trying to extrapolate from this particular data? So, no, sorry, let me, let, me, uh, re let me repeat what Brian was asking. He said, for those of us who aren't familiar with climate data, or, or maybe any particular type of data in general, what, what is this data representing, and what might you be trying to extrapolate from it? So I take it you work in climate. <laughs> Sorry? No, he's laughing, so I take it he works in climate. Um, so the thing with this is um, it's totally exploratory. Like I'm trying to figure out here the precipitation patterns, rainfall patterns over the globe of the past 30 years. Like there's no, there's no, this isn't predictive, or it might end up being predictive, but this is at first level exploratory research where I'm trying to characterize the data. So. Yeah, like find structural patterns and I'm trying to see like how does rain work um, according to this data set. Uh, so yeah, so like I was saying, you know, okay, to figure out how does rain work, we're going to start looking at our machine learning libraries. And as I was saying earlier, the reason we Python is so good for this is Python makes machine learning easy. You don't need to know much about it, you don't really need to be a math geek or um, or linear algebra geek, or any of that stuff. Um, and I'll, I'll show you next, like, you know, okay, so we're dealing with 10,000, so we're dealing with like 10,000 dimensions, right? And I'm saying these 10,000 dimensions, each of these have a time series, but maybe, maybe, I can, maybe, I don't actually need the entire globe to tell me about the temporal relations in Python. Ooh. <laughs> okay, so we, yeah, so the idea is let's not actually have to look at all 10,000 time series to figure out paths. Maybe only a handful of locations on Earth are really going to matter. Right? Maybe I only need to know three places on it to find out like what's the real pattern in time. So there's a standard technique called principal component analysis. And what it is is like you take the eigenvalue of this and the eigenvector of that and you rank and you take the identity matrix and you know, 
it's math and more math and more math. And <laughs> yeah, um, you can tell I. Know that. Um, so what happens with Psy kids is so this is where SK Learn comes in because SK Learn throws all that away. It says you don't have to know that. I'm gonna just you know import my PCA, um, take the number of components, read some documentation, and just pop it in and get a result. And you can pop that up. And you can now plot that. And so you, and this is saying, I don't need all 10,000 places on Earth. If I take three places on Earth, I can find a pattern. This pattern is that Maine is very month, is Maine is monthly. That's what it's saying. Each of these That's clusters great. is a month. The data clusters amount months. Yeah. Okay. So I think I see what's up there. Just two seconds for the mic to come on. Okay. All right. Hi. I, I think I see what's up there. So you take three components of some PCA you've performed, and, um, but then in addition, there's implicitly, I think, you also have the months, you have the times of the year, because that looks like it's something that's going around in a circle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which one's January? Um, I don't know on this one. Okay. No, no, I that think was, it's this one. I just wanted to make sure that, you know, all right, okay, thanks. Yeah. But, yeah. Is this an example of a random forest algorithm? I don't think so. I, I, Can you repeat the question? He's asking if this is an example of a random forest algorithm. And uh, the thing is, I don't think so, because I think it's a straight matrix decomposition. That's what you're doing here. You're just trying to find out which, like, where is the sig signal storing this matrix. Um, what? The signal. Basically, yeah. The idea is you treat each time series yeah, and that's in volume. And this is going to be the overall of volume. But again, you can slice it as the Yeah, as it um, comes. And what they did also that you might not have to slice it. But at the end of the day, I'm going to say, I'm going to take all those 10,000 and say, hey, I only really have a signal in three of them. So let's only look at those three. And this is, and you're discarding all of those. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and so this is kind of a standard technique. And by the way, I can then take that and we project it back to get my data. So this also uses form of confession. Because what it's saying is, hey, if I can reproject back, then I only really, and I can get close accuracy, then I only need those three anyways. And so like when I'm trying to go with these huge data sets, this is a way to just like close it up. The, okay, so that's PCA. Um, and the other one I use all the time, so I'm showing it, is clustering. And clustering says the same kind of thing. It's like, it says like signals are similar to other like signals, right? So let's see if we can, and again, we're not going to start trying to look at the entire globe. We want to see which, that one, so the PCA is going to say which time, how is that time? What's the strongest element of time? This is saying, hey, which parts of the globe are similar? Which of them show similar, similar time signature? And again, instead of having to write k-means, which is the nearest neighbor algorithm where you're doing a ton of distance calculations, or you're doing a and n tree and backtracking, or you know, trying to sort out you know, what's the smartest way of doing this, um, you can just plug it in, choose how many centers you think you'll have, and let it run. It's all just a, a statue of the object, fit it, and let it run. So again, okay, you can do Can I ask a question? <coughs> So when you approach a problem like this, or when you first started learning about this, how long did it take you to come up with this as this style of a, a, a solution that would work for you? What kind of research did you have to do to get there? How, how did you get to this point? Yeah. My lab mate yeah, here is laughing so. because this is one of those, my advisor happens to, yeah. like this is his technique. So I didn't really, I lucked out and I didn't have yeah. to learn about this. It's been years of experience and then they come up yeah. with this pattern. But, <laughs> so, but I mean, how do I learn like, like this kind of stuff, you know, like how do I look? It's usually it's one of those when I'm looking at kind of what techniques other people are doing or like when I'm looking at the libraries, I look at like what else they have and from there I start, you know, finding, oh, this might be cool to do too. Like. Uh, like, I want to try a bunch of the other clustering algorithms. I'm used to k-means and it's easy and it works great on huge data sets because they'll pre-partition and some of the other ones aren't so awesome on larger data sets. Um, but if you look at the scikit page, and I think this is wonderful, they have a little tutorial of clustering algorithms. They have what these data sets look like, how they're going to be partitioned by the algorithm, 
You know, so from there you can almost kind of pick and choose. Like my data set kind of looks like this. Hey, let's use that algorithm and see what comes out. What's that again? Um, that's that's, 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 that's k yeah, that's yeah. And so. What was the website? Um, SKLearn is the one you're going to be using. The so it's SK, is the website SKLearn not? They look for SciKids, oh. SciKids Learn. So to search for SciKids. Yeah, or search for SKLearn. Okay. Yeah. Some explanations for what you guys were just talking about? Okay, so we're talking about so K means, which is this algorithm. What it does is it takes you, it says, as it said, I know it's going to have n number of k number of clusters. Predetermined, I know what. I just now got to partition my data into that number of clusters. So what we're saying is because the number of clusters is predetermined, and the way it works is it keeps updating its centers. Based on um, it keeps up to, based on how you can classify what observations get classified to what you can it's trivial to do it online as a streaming algorithm because you're just gonna because your number of clusters is always fixed anyways. Yeah. So what I was trying to explain was that <coughs> because the centers keep changing, it's really hard. It's it's really hard to uh, measure the running time. <coughs> can means can means can actually take quite a while because what happens if the center yeah. if the center changes a um, very small amount continuously back and forth, then you miss it at a minimum, and then you you're basically stuck there waiting for hours. So it's it's you have to be careful. That's pretty much all I want to say. Okay. Um, so this is so these are. Kind of our standard. So the other thing we can play with is okay. So we talk about we say we talk about clustering, and now we can have more machine learning. You know, SKLearn also has your base, your hidden model core, your unsupervised your model selection. Like if you can think of it, it's probably there. If they don't have it, if you're dealing with a time series, pandas. Pandas is all for Python. That's kind of the best way to think about it. Um, it supports time series data. It supports rotating your cells based on what you're looking for. It's super high powered. 
Um, and it just has great terminal syntax and technology. If you're really a newbie to machine learning, I would maybe suggest Orange, because Orange has a little GUI you can play with, and it has a visual language interface. But it also has an underlying Python library, so you can get comfortable in the Orange GUI space, and then by Python code underneath. Because when you're dealing with higher data, you don't want to be working with these. Excuse me. Common filters are in SciPy. Okay. They're part of the SciPy that signal. Okay. Um, yeah, anything you need for robotics is there. The other thing is if you're dealing with like robotics and image data, OpenCV has Python libraries. And OpenCV handles streaming because it has a video it has algorithms dealing with video. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I've been thinking of using the OpenCV for the climate data because of that. Um, oh, for those who don't know, OpenCV is, used to be sponsored by IBM, it's now, no, not IBM, Intel, it's now sponsored, one of the other, and it's now sponsored by Willow Garage, which is an open source robotics initiative, and it's a, the open computer vision library, and it's kind of the standard in computer vision for doing data analysis. But because it's made for computer vision, a lot of the algorithms will also look really well on big data, because vision, um, videos, you often get large. And also accelerate it, and also support graphic acceleration? I think some of them. You have to like, dig in. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. And, yeah. And the other thing is because Willow Garage has a lot of investment in it, like, it's really being maintained. Um, okay, so if you're in the climate community, um, the other big one to use is CDAP, which is, I think it's, an, it's either an NCAR or a PML. It's one of the government lab's products. And again, it's GUI based. Um, machine learning type. Um, let's see on that. And um, then there's, if you do semantic web, natural processing, there's natural natural language to toolkit. Um, again, it has kind of all your standard algorithms doing this kind of stuff. Okay, so we have all this machine learning, right? So I've dumped out numbers. What, how do I make sense of it? Pictures, right? How am I going to make my pictures? Um, so here, whenever we're doing a picture, because we want to still, you know, figure out what this data is saying, and we're visual people, so it's easier to look at graphs than to try to, you know, do analysis. So, map.lib has boilerplate. The boilerplate is, let's set up the digger, and we're going to save it out eventually. How many of you have played with map.lib? Great. So, so, I mean, what's our two standards, right? Our two standards is uh, <coughs> um, time series. Like, we like that time series, right? We have a nice long thing, we want to have pretty dates, we want to say what it means. And so MapLib has super simplified time series now. You take your time, you get it in any form that's a nice Python daytime object, and then you just apply date. It will almost generally take care of putting stuff in the right select section. If it doesn't, you can write your own code. If you don't know where to start on that, um, my Google Scholar Code Project has a lot of the kind of code you can use for how to custom write tickers and bases and everything. You know, get into the guts of Map.lib to make things tilt the right way. And that's used to be this. Okay, so what am I doing here, right? So I have my labels, and this is what's called fancy indexing. Don't do it, it's slow. <laughs> Um, I will tell you it, it, it's slow. The reason, don't, or only do it to do a selection task, or in this case where I know my data set is small enough to handle it. Generally, um, you do not want to do it in the midst of like a, you know, midst of an algorithm, anytime you're doing a loop of a thousand elements, you know, if you're doing a loop a thousand times, don't do it. Um, but for something like this, it's great, because it's saying, hey, grab me all the indices where that label is equal to that. And this is how I'm going to just pull out. The idea here is I'm going to try to get the centroid mean, the mean, the mean of all the time series with what, the same label is what I'm trying to get here. So I'm going to just filter through, pop those out, and then plot them. And how you plot multiple time series is you just you know, keep, plot, keep plotting on the same axis as a standard. That's kind of what it's doing. If I also want the label, I can do a keyword argument label and label equals, and that'll just, and then you can do a plot, um, axis dot legend, and that's it for like, and to get your legends, you have fittingness, and kind of no fuss. The other thing, oh, and 
the daytime thing. So yeah, Python built inside library supports kind of any kind of most of the daytime functionality you'll ever need. So if you find that your data didn't come with time streams, you can just generate your own. It's often useful for some of the more valid package data. Okay. So the other thing we want is map data, right? Map data is nice, it's pretty. Um, base map, we like base map. Base map has about 30 different projections. So if they can go on a globe, base map can probably play some globe correctly. Um, it's got, you know, your Robinson, your Asimov, your equal. This one is called cylindrical equidistance. But um, all the standard, all the standard projections are represented here. And so it's the same thing. We tell it how we want to project it. We want, we tell it where our data starts and ends, and we let it do its thing. And then it has a bunch of these kind of draw coastlines, fill coastlines, fill ocean, draw parallels, you know, so we can make our map all pretty. And then we're just doing im show or contour, or im show or plot show or contour show or contour, or any of the standard map plot lib plot routines that we use for data, for this kind of heat map data or map data, um, base map supports so or base map maps. So you use it, the object on the base map object and you just let it go. And that's your map. You know, kind of this super dead simple. And so the only other thing we might want to do with this, <coughs> right, so we have our data. Um, often because we're dealing with time data sets, we don't want to, again, we don't want to be generating stuff client side. Because we could be trying to visualize like megs or gigs, like me megs or kilobytes worth, I'm sorry, megs worth of data, right, in one shot. So sometimes we want to do it server side. And so this is kind of the no fuss, no must way to get server side visualization. Um, you create your figure, um, you create a response using Python web library of choice, and you just print your image response, like you would to a file. And that's it. And this works in Django and Pyramid and Bottle and Flask, and I think if you really wanted to, you could do it in like WebCGI. So, it's kind of safe over there. WebCGI is the like super low level method. Okay. Questions? Um, raise your hand and I'll bring the mic around. Uh, I saw him. We'll start on this side. So, uh, since you said it's all time around, what about pie tables? Can you use pie tables? I played with it a little. Um, I like it. I, when I was playing with it, it was kind of slow, but I think it's gotten better. The thing I really liked it before, though, is I was trying to say a file that was like 8 or 10 gigs, and it could handle, say, not a file that's 8 or 10 gigs. So if you're doing this kind of filtering and convolution, you're not going to pack your data. It really smooths things out for you. Um, and when I was giving the presentation, the guy said, like, NASA's so trying. Is there also like a place where you think like R can work like this, or do you need to just stick with just Python or whatever? I think, I mean, that's a, well, two things. If you really want Pi, there's R, there's also Pi. But otherwise, I think Pandas has been trying, that's what kind of Pandas is that one more for, is to feel that, you know, I really want this in Python, not quite there, but R has it, because that's what they're trying for. Are there good places? Is there a single good place to find information about the map plotlib in HTML response stuff that you found? <laughs> no. Um, no. So I mean, I found that thing about the how you actually do that using cookbook, the map plotlib cookbook or the sci-fi cookbook. Um, there is another, and if you look through the cookbook, I think there is something about if you want. There's map.lib HTML5 Canvas, which is a Python library that will do some of that. Or you can use HTML5 Canvas, the map.lib backend, and like it's a supported backend. So I would look at their documentation and their tutorials. Are you using the latest versions of map to support more on it? Mom, mom, mom. I use the latest versions of map to support more on it. Do you think map.lib is more on it? I mean, for 
while we're using the dev version, it depends. Like on some of the machines, yeah. I'm using the dev versions for everything, and on some of the machines, if I'm using if I'm using a virtual end, then I'm using whatever pip installs. If I'm doing it by hand, then I'm using the uh, it's the whatever was the last dev version I updated to. Okay. <clears throat> Anna, could you compare the advantages and disadvantages of using this library to see the R programming language? Well, I like Python, and I think R syntax works well <laughs> if they know. Um, also, the thing with R is, from what I was hearing, because like pandas won't do it either, is when you're dealing with data sets that also have really high spatial, um, R is really good for time series. I think the problem is when you have a really high spatial resolution and really high temporal resolution, then you start kind of, I think I'd be curious, like things are, I don't have enough experience in R to really say, but what I'm hearing is like things will start to fall apart. Um, I, do, I do recall from our, our presenter uh, earlier on that uh, there are built-in limits of things like two, two to thirty-second objects being able to be referenced in, a, in an array in R. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. <coughs> you didn't talk about any Hadoop stuff. Is how easy or difficult is it to interface Python with Hadoop? Have you tried that? I haven't. I did because I haven't needed to, but I was looking at like Disco, and Disco looks really, really straightforward. It's kind of like if you, oh, that's just a bad example, but if you've ever seen the twisted examples of file or processing. But um, it looks like basically you can just straight up write a, you know, write your function that you're going to do as a map or whatever and just pass it. Do you have a specific example that you're interested in, in trying out? Um, no, just interfacing Python with Hadoop. Most people I know of use Java with Hadoop. Yeah. Since you are a Python person. Yeah. No, but I've been thinking about it because the upside is, and I meant to tell this earlier, is that if you're doing this on Amazon, you can do like the Boto library, which talks to Amazon Web Services, is super well developed and like handles everything. So you can like, you know, do Boto for your data management stuff and to your job management stuff and, you know, what it will do or whatever. BLT on that. Okay. Uh, I just want to say on a related note, there's a Hadoop streaming API. It allows you to use whatever language you want. Um, it's a standard thing now. as a connecting with Spring Equities. So it's also a good thing. Do we have any other questions? No, okay. I, just, I, have, I just have a comment. So, uh, I'm going to make you use the mic again. Here we go. Yeah, if you do decide to use Numpy, um, make sure before you actually install it that you also build Atlas, which stands for automatically tuned by the automatically tuned linear algebra libraries. Oh. And that will use SSC, which is uh, basically 128 bit registers, as well as multi threading. So, um, matrix multiplications would increase by a factor of 100 to 1,000 depending on your underlying yes. architecture. Yeah, here's, the, and I'll add to this, basically don't, if you really need to run out of time, don't ever build NumPy or SciPy for. Um, I think, I mean, some of it I think is handled automatically now, yeah, so, so, so but some you, systems have Atlas installed, some don't. Yeah, but them. you want to be using Atlas, Atlas and LatPak and Blast, Blast and kind of the linear algebra C for Transstat, um, because they'll do a lot of the optimizations. Otherwise, SciPy will do stuff in more Python, which is okay. not so, good. Fine. So where would you get the instructions to actually do this installation? The um, sci-fi webpage actually has it. Like stuff. the correct way? Yeah. It's usually the correct <laughs> um, And if it's not, then the mailing list, the sci-fi mailing list is super active, but people tend to actually respond. Yeah. Have you ever used pre-packaged uh, sci-fi and then installs like um, yeah. in thought or other installations? I, I mean, so I use the one you can get from PIP, PIP install, so that's the PyPython package one all the time, and I usually don't have a problem with that. Um, the other one, I've used Edco, but I generally use that one as a teaching tool because it's the only one that works correctly on 64 bit Max. So. Does anyone have any other questions, or do we want to go to the, uh, to the giveaways? All right.
Okay, so we have um, some of you have three questions for uh, for the audience. Um, probably. <laughs> All right, so um, take it away. We have uh, the first gift and the first question. Okay. Um, so I mean, um, about how many projections did they come for? All right. Did you say it was like thirty-two? Yeah. Yes. All right. <laughs> you have a free ebook. Next question. Um, um, okay. What data type do kind of all of Python do all of the library sorting files? What is the actual data that is all into?